So it's, um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm a, I feel a little bit of a fraud because I don't actually work most of my time in homelessness. So for those of you who wondered if Alex had missed books, he probably has, but go with it. And um, the second thing was I got up this morning and my niece told me that I looked like Where's Wally? So <laughs> I thought this was going to be a great day. Um, so, um, so here we go. So this is me if you, if you want to uh, get in contact afterwards. And um, that's not my Twitter handle because I don't do Twitter, but that's a colleague of mine, John Patterson, who does Twitter obsessively. So you can always tweet him and tell him I was rubbish. Um, so this is called Even If You're Little, You Can Do A Lot. Um, you mustn't let a little thing like little stop you. And it's a quote from um, one of my favourite musicals, Matilda. If any of you get the opportunity to see Matilda, I would definitely go and see it. If you live life by the musicals, life is much better. Um, and it's a little bit about what I've done and what we've done as a team. So um, I grew up in a very affluent St Albans. Um, I went to a very posh school that you had to wear a deck chair blazer. Um, I learned to play lacrosse, which is a game no one else ever plays. I um, got some really good A-levels, I was entirely square, and um, I also learnt to like, do embroidery, French cooking and flute playing. So I was like entirely set up for the modern era. <laughs> and, um, and when I left school at 18, I, I wanted to be a doctor and I applied for medical school and my school refused to sign my UCAS form because they said I didn't have the personality to be a doctor because I was a bit too rebellious with my French cooking. So, so I went to, um, I did a gap year, and actually I met Gary Bishop, who um, some of you will know at that year as well. And um, I moved into Harper Hay, and Harper Hay at the time was one of the worst um, places in England for crime and also deprivation. So I went from this kind of Hertfordshire girl to living in a two-up, two-down terrace house behind the dog's home. And I have to say, that is when I think my education really started. And I realised quite quickly that the rules I'd grown up with were just not the rules that existed here. All my normal rules about if you work hard, if you do your best, life kind of pans out for you just didn't make any sense. It's just not true. If you live in an area of deprivation and the social gradient is against you, you can work as hard as you damn well like and you still don't get anywhere. And it really started to shape my, my understanding. So I lived there for, for about three years. And then I met, I met my husband um, and... Just as we got married, we got asked to move to a different area called in, um, in Oldham called Fitton Hill and to set up another project called Eden. So we lived there for the next 12 years. And while I was living there, I met some really great people. So I swapped my two up, two down for a three-bedroom terrace house and, um, in Oldham. And when I first went to Oldham, um, it's on the hills, it's quite grey and it's quite deprived. And I remember driving up, and the sky was grey, and the houses were grey, and the roads were grey, and I, we drove away again, and I called it Shitton Hill, and my <laughs> husband... And it took me a while to learn to love it. But I met some really great people there, um, and there were a couple of people that made me stop. So one was a girl called Rachel, so she was in Half Hay, and she was a girl who was in my youth group that we called Chaos, for obvious reasons. And she was 13, and unfortunately, one night when we, she would come to my youth group, and um, she was a little bit tipsy, but they were kind of quite normal. And um, I was walking her home afterwards, and she got hit by a police car. And she um, eventually she died, but before she died, she was in intensive care in, in uh, the children's hospital. And I was there with her mum, and I was quite young, so I was 21. And um, I was really upset, and the mum was really upset, obviously. And this... Um, intensive care doctor said to me about two in the morning, is she from a poor area? And I was like, yeah, yeah, she is. He's like, is her mum very well educated? And I was like, not really. And he went, that's the only people we see run over, you know, kids. They all live in poor areas on trunk roads. And that's health inequalities, isn't it? So I watched that little girl die as they turned off the ventilator and realised that the stats have real meaning in real people. The next lady was a lady called Joan, who was my neighbour. Joan was an alcoholic. And I came home from medical school. I did get in, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, I came home from medical school, and Joan was sat on the doorstep. Now, everyone sits on the doorstep, so that wasn't unusual. But her wrist was, like, completely bent the wrong way. You didn't need to be a medical student. Now, this wrist was definitely broken. So we tip up to A&E. And even though I'm there, A&E treat her with just such a disdain. 
And you don't need an x-ray to know the risk is definitely broken. But we have to go to fracture clinic, and then we go to fracture clinic the next day, and they want to see her in two weeks' time, but I'll send her an appointment in the post, and guess what? She can't read, and open a post. Da, da, da. She never, ever, ever got her wrist fixed. And it's just stuck. And then the third one was Betty and Ward, and Betty was my neighbour the other side, and they were lovely. So Betty was about 60, and Ward was about 40. And Ward had learning disabilities, the two of them were just completely codependent on each other. And one day, Betty had a stroke. And um, I realised quite quickly that the healthcare she was getting was not what I was learning at medical school. I was learning all these really complicated pathways about drugs and blood pressure and fancy things, and she had none of it. And the follow-up was just terrible. And I realised that, what happens to her if she has another stroke? And what happens to Ward? Where is he going to go? And I just got really angry. So we had... Um, we had somebody from the, from the Salvation Army, my, my husband's boss, come to visit us. And I was meant to be doing the vicar's wife thing and creating like a nice meal and stuff. And just as I got to pudding, I made it that far. And this guy said, if we could do anything for your estate, what would it be? And I went, I'd have a health centre. It's like health centre, the health of this estate is the thing that's holding it back. We had a new deal for communities project at the time. We had quite a lot of investment. We had a great policing, a community policing structure. We had no health care. And as I said it, I knew that's what we wanted. So we started a community campaign to get a health centre put into Fitton Hill. And um, it, came, it got approved and it became one of the Darcy projects. And so having got approval, I went to see this wonderful NHS manager. Have you met one like this? I've met several. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, it seems that you've been so damn annoying. You, can ha you could have a go if you want. You could tender. And I went, I will. And I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. That's why I was a third year medical student. I had two small children. It's not ideal. <laughs> but we basically formed Hope Citadel. And it was a, it's a, similar to Bevan. It's a social enterprise, which is really important in ways I can't quite explain. And we just had this really simple and very naive vision that if you could combine good medicine with compassion, creativity, common sense, and commitment, you might get something different. You might change individuals. You might change families. And you might change a whole community. And that's how we started. So we started in this porter cabin. It's, it's lovely and grey, isn't it? It's the thing about greyness and order. And that's me sat on the front there with, um, with my third baby who was born just as we opened. <laughs> um, and this is us now. So we're now in a, in a really lovely purpose-built building that um, we fought for and we got funding for. And it's amazing. And this is a lovely team there. So, I just want to show you some pictures of these guys because I don't really do hardly any of the work. They do a lot of the work. So, and we've done some lots of stuff a bit like uh, similar to Bevan. Let the compassion of your patients and your community um, lead you. The one thing about living in a community where you're also doing healthcare is very short complaints route to my door. <laughs> so we had to work that one out. How do you live there and work there and everyone knows you're there and have your kids at the school and everything. That was, you know, I, I knew if something was wrong very quickly. Um, but we've tried lots of stuff, and we have lots of stuff. We have a craft group, and we have a, um, an on-off choir. They're rubbish, but they love it. Um, we, have a veg <laughs> we have a vegetable garden thing that, uh, that grows something, not very, not very much, but lots of people pot around it for a lot of the day. Uh, we have cooking classes. In, we have a toddler group th twice a week. We have an art club, um, and we have a knitting thing. And there's just always something going on. I just say yes, fine, whatever. Um, but the background to healthcare is complicated, isn't it? And I know you guys know, but the social determinants of health are the social determinants of health. And Oldham has had universal credit for eight years. So we've had eight years of universal credit. And what's interesting is that all the changes that have currently been announced, including the ones about you know, not ca capping it for mothers with more than two children, have not been backdated to the people who've been through the system. So we have had, in the last eight years, I cannot tell you, so we've ended up opening our own food bank in our practice. We've ended up opening a, um, a utensils thing. We've got towels and bedding and clothing and school uniform and Christmas presents, and it all just comes out of the practice. And without it, I don't actually know what happened to our patients. So uh, um, the other thing is that um, Zeraz has had a massive impact on our estate. So we used to have some nice, quite solid jobs. Like if you could get some of your men into parks and gardens, they got paid regularly and they potted around planting daffodils and stuff. And then that's all been outsourced and it's zero hour contracts now. And it just, just undermines another layer of security for people, doesn't it? So 
we have a real passion to make the invisible patient visible. <coughs> this is a bit geeky, this bit, but you can just zone out for two, two minutes. So this is a, a map of Birmingham, and the one on the right is, um, is the coloured areas is where the NHS say that people have heart disease. That's if you look at GP registers, all the people who say they've got heart disease on the register, that's where they live. And the one on the left is where our public data shows us people die of heart disease. And that is for heart disease, but that map is the same map for anything. COPD, mental health, smears, access to contraception, you name it, that's the inequality. The inequality does exist at the real sharp end with you guys in your homeless work and inclusion health, but it's much bigger than that. Where I live, so many people are just so poor that our health inequalities are undefinable by people group. They're just there. So we talk about health inequalities being a bubble. This is for diabetes in Manchester. And um, basically, it's 150,000 people with diabetes in Manchester. And then you can have your diabetic care, and then there's a group of people who don't get good enough care. And so there's a bunch of people who are on the register, but they don't hit the target. So they're having un, you know, the, the, the care isn't good enough. There's a bunch of people who are on the register who we know aren't going to hit the target, so we will exempt them, which is a technical solution to make your figures better. And then there's a bunch of people who have diabetes, but we don't know about them. And when you take that population group, that's nearly 51,000 people. And when we look at our health inequalities trends and we say, why do we keep missing it when we're investing in things like this? It's because that group of people never get hit. And what puts you in that bubble is, is all the stuff that social determinants of health. It's, it's being um, a young mum. It's having a mental health problem. It's having a learning disability. It's being a veteran. It's having trauma in your life. It's being homeless. It's been in care. It's having a relationship breakdown. It's all the things that you guys know about put you in that bubble. And once you're in that bubble, it's very difficult to get out. So when we started Hope Citadel, our first 800 patients had a really great deal. We did really well with them. And then we got above 800, we were knackered. And we thought, we have to have a different way of doing this. So we got Ruth, and Ruth is a health visitor by training and a midwife. And we just said to her, come along, go and visit all these patients in their, in their houses and find out what's really going on, what's the problems behind the problems. And we called it focused care because we didn't want anyone to be um, stigmatised by it. And... We think that health inequalities is basically failure to thrive, barriers to universal services, and social determinants of health. And focus care is something that we are trying to put into practices in Greater Manchester to unhook some of this. The reason we talk about failure to thrive, failure to thrive is Nick from paediatrics. It's the only bit of medicine I know. And, um, but it means you can, it's a, it's a term you can use as a clinician that doesn't medicalise it. So you can unpick it. So we talk about our adults with failure to thrive and our households with failure to thrive, rather than saying it's definitely depression, it's definitely anxiety, it's definitely this. We talk about it. It's much, much more freeing as a clinician to be able to, to practice like that. So um, this is Jamie, and he has given permission to share his pictures and all that kind of stuff. But um, ITV came to film us, so um, you can catch this, some of this on YouTube. I've nicked it. But um, So Jamie's classically, he came to the surgery and... He is homeless, but we're not homeless surgery, and he was living on the allotment. Um, so we gave him a tent, and it took a while to unpick stuff, but we got him into various services. And Ruth worked with him quite a lot. And the hug there is when he was told that he was going to get a flat. So Ruth really argued for him to get a flat, got his benefits sorted out, we got his skin sorted out, he had amazing, like, horrible legs. And, and that's the day he moved into his flat, and he's just started a volunteering apprenticeship. And um, this is how we said thank you to Ruth. Um, was that he, um, he cultured some snails in his allotment <laughs> and then made her a snail dinner. <laughs> and she ate it. <laughs> but I put that in because um, one thing about working with people is they're so generous, aren't they? And he genuinely wanted to thank her because they'd been working together for about a year and he had nothing else to give. So he, he, he spent two weeks growing these snails. Oh, there you go. 
Um, so focus care worked quite well, and so we were challenged about seven years ago by the NHS that if it worked in our practice, would it work in another practice? So the local CCG gave us a bit of money and said, you can do focus care in the practice and we'll pick the practice. And so we went, okay, fine. And um, unfortunately, the week after we started the practice, um, the GP got arrested for something really terrible, and the practice nearly fell apart. Um, but we carried on anyway. And what was interesting about focus care is that even if you put this wonderful, compassionate lady into a normal, slightly dysfunctional general practice, she got the same outcomes, and that made it slightly exciting. And so now we've been funded to do focus care in a Greater Manchester, and we've got 50 practices, all in the most deprived areas of Greater Manchester, with focus care. And so we have an army of Roos who are compassionate, experienced people. They have to have a qualification in something in health and social care. And they're the kind of people who never went for a management job because they think that's pointless, but they love the front line. And they get really peed off of all the boundaries and the silo working. We give them this badge and we give them this massive remit. And I say, you can do anything to help people with failure to thrive. And you can be creative and they do it. And then you have to have a bit of governance to cover them. But basically they get a lot of, they get a lot of freedom. And it seems to be working. Um, so we've got some early outcome data. That's the age range and stuff for you. There's loads of stats and return on investment, all that dull stuff. But what has been interesting about focused care was that it's allowed other GP practices to unlock something in them. Can I tell you a story when I was a student? Is that all right? So when I was a student, I was sent up to the ward. And if you're a medical student, you have to go and like, interview a patient. And then you have to come back to a consultant and you have to feed back what you found out. Okay. This sounds quite simple. You've got this massive checklist that you have to try and remember and get all the questions asked. So I went, it's called clerking. So I went clerking on this ward and I met this man and I spent a very long time diligently clerking him and uh, found out all this information. And I went back to the consultant and I knew about this guy's name and his relationships and I could tell you the name of his cat and I knew what kind of football team he supported and what, what he thought of the hospital dinners. And I said all this, and I had a bit of medicine. And the consultant went back on his heels like this. And he went, Laura, that was very interesting. But you have failed to mention that he is, in fact, bright yellow. <laughs> he, said, he said, did you not notice that he looks like Homer Simpson? <laughs> And I went, oh, well, yeah, I did actually notice that he, he's quite yellow. But, and I realised the reason I hadn't admitted that he was yellow is because I didn't know why he was yellow, what to do about him being yellow, or that I knew I wouldn't be able to answer any of the frigging questions the guy was going to ask me. <laughs> and what I found is that when we go into normal general practice, most GPs are actually all right. There's a few real bad ones there, but most of them are lovely people who went to do medicine to try and do a good job. But... If you, and they're really good at picking up cues, but if they haven't got anywhere to put that, to pass the patient on to, what do they do? And so over years, they've just learned to ignore it. And just like me saying, I didn't, know, you know, I didn't even notice, didn't acknowledge the patient was yellow, we find a lot of general practices do that with their patients. And if you're in a normal general practice and you don't specialise, in our, in our practice, we've still got people who are in prostitution and homelessness, and we've got refugees, and we've got the majority of our cohort are just very chaotic people. It's difficult. So what we found with focused care is that it's a way of unlocking that compassion and allowing the whole team to have a more compassionate response. And it's really interesting as a kind of education exercise with, with um, clinicians and nurses and stuff. So um, we... We're equally passionate about education, and um, we've just started a GP training scheme specialising in deprivation. It started um, like four weeks ago, um, or hopefully it'll go all right. If anybody wants to help us, please, that would be very helpful. Um, but we are passionate about training GPs properly so that they can land in areas of deprivation. Having employed quite a few now, I've realised they're just not trained with enough skills for my cohort of residents. Um, so coming back to Matilda... Even if you're little, you can do a lot, and you mustn't let a little thing like little stop you. Just a final thought about things that you can take away from Matilda. So one, some reasons why Matilda is my, one of my heroes. One is she's curious. When you leave here today, carry on being curious. A lot of what you guys have started and the work you're developing and all the stuff I've heard about in the workshops is really amazing is because you're curious. 
carry on being curious. She finds comrades. This is Lavender, her best mate. Find a comrade. I was really lucky that I have a really great team around me from the start. But find a friend who will do it with you. Um, she builds people up. Let's be really inclusive about our inclusion. <laughs> Let's not be snobby that we're like working in a more poor area than you or my client group's harder than yours. Let's just be broadly inclusive and teach everybody how to do this better. She knew instinctively right from wrong. And in healthcare, it's really easy to lose that instinct. In my gut, I knew the healthcare my neighbours were getting was wrong. And I still see healthcare and I still see systems that are wrong. Don't lose that sense of injustice. She had eyes that see. She went to Miss Honey's for tea and she noticed it was different. Keep having eyes that see. Um, she recognised inadequacies of the system she was in, but she was not limited by them. She had terrible parents. She had a horrible brother. She had a crook of a father. And yet she was not limited by that. Even if we have all the funding in the world, which we're not going to get, um, there is still stuff we can do. We can do loads with what we already have. She subversively fights injustice. And you guys are amazing injustice fighters. Carry on. Just carry on. And she gives space for the miraculous to happen. I had no idea when I said, turned around to that manager and said, I'll bid what would happen. Ten years on, it's, it's amazing. It's bonkers. It's hard work. Some days are awful. Some days are brilliant. But it has been amazing to see what's blossomed out of it. So give space for stuff to grow. And... Um, the song at the end of the, um, at the, end of the uh, musical, I I'm not singing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it says, um, just because you find that life's not fair, it doesn't mean that you just have to grin and bear it. If you always take it on the chin and wear it, nothing will change. Even if you're little, you can do a lot. You mustn't let a little thing like little stop you. If you sit around and let them get on top of you, you're just admitting it. So, and it ends with, sometimes you just have to be a little bit naughty. <laughs> Thank you.